already off. So, um, um, so welcome again, all of our members, friends, supporters um, of, uh, of Wild Oxfordshire, and um, very much looking forward to this um, annual lecture. Um, I'm going to mute myself now and hand over to Camilla. Okay, that's um, brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, as David said, um, I'm Camilla, the Chief Executive of Wild Oxfordshire, and I'm going to give you um, a very brief update of what we've been up to in the last year. Um, I don't have time to cover everything we've done, so if you would like to find out more, then um, do check out our annual report, which is on our website, and also um, sign up to our monthly email bulletin, um, and then you'll be kept up to date with everything all throughout the year. Um, at Wild Oxfordshire, we've had a good year in 2022, despite um, all the usual, now usual COVID chaos. Um, and as a result, of uh, support from a variety of funders um, we've actually and an increased demand for our services we've created two new roles and welcomed two new members of staff so um, we've got Rhiannon who's now working with Roselle on the community ecology work and um, we've got a vacancy because we did have someone and they've left um, to be working with Anne on the even node catchment partnership so that's um, that's really great to have um, new staff and more capacity to be able to deliver even more um, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an update on the um, community ecology work. Um, we've had 30 years experience of working with communities and what that has shown us is that it's really vital to have a community ecologist who can respond to requests for support and be consistently available over the long term. This is because um, relationships and trust with communities and individuals takes time to build and not every group needs us every year. So that's why we're really keen to secure long-term consistent funding for this area of work. Um, this year, we started an exciting new partnership with CPRE, Campaign to Protect Rural England, and that enabled uh, communities in Oxfordshire to plant 2,000 metres of hedgerow and rejuvenate another 370 metres this winter. And we had over 600 people in total attending our training webinars and practical training events. Uh, all about creating and managing hedgerows. We're really hoping to extend this project into 2022 uh, with further support from funders and we're in discussions with a few people uh, about that because uh, it's really been such a successful project and a really great way to get communities uh, and landowners um, involved in nature's recovery. Um, and this work that we do with community groups has so many benefits. So not only uh, is there more and better management for wildlife, which is obviously really important, but also um, you create uh, better green spaces for the benefit of all of the community. So those who are interested in nature and those who aren't so much as well. So it's something for everyone. And uh, the volunteer groups improve community cohesion um, and supporting and training these groups results in enthused groups that continue to work for nature in their community um, after we've finished um, supporting them. But they also know that we are there if they need us in future, which is really important. Um, this year, we also started the Even Node Smarter Water Catchment, which um, is a development of the innovative work we've achieved by hosting the Even Node Catchment Partnership since 2014. This pilot project has a three million pound budget up to 2025 to deliver a range of projects with uh, local communities and other organisations in Oxfordshire working together to deliver benefits for freshwater ecosystems and wildlife. And that's the work that Anne is leading on. So we're really excited about that, um, about that project. Um, as Mike mentioned at the beginning, if anyone um, arrived early, we've also been working on preparing for the forthcoming local nature recovery strategy for Oxfordshire. So we've been working um, with the University Ox of Oxford, Trust for Oxfordshire's Environment, Thames Valley Environmental Record Centre and the Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust, plus others, on several projects. Um, one of these is identifying nature recovery ambassadors from the farming and business sectors so that we can get really meaningful stakeholder input from these important areas. We've also been developing a natural capital investment plan so that we can ensure that we can actually fund the delivery of nature's recovery on the ground because it's one thing having a strategy we also want to make sure that it actually delivers on the ground as well. And we've also been working on um, developing the evidence base and monitoring protocols so that we can measure success. So this combination uh, of working with communities and organisations in partnership 
and linking these on the ground projects to county wide initiatives and strategies is unique to World Oxfordshire and is really important if we are going to deliver nature's recovery. Um, so the art of translating policy into practice brings us on to COP26 and our main speaker, um, Professor Sir Dieter Helm. Uh, Dieter probably needs no introduction, um, but just in case you weren't aware, um, Dieter is Professor of Economic Policy at the University of Oxford and Fellow in Economics at New College Oxford. And from 2012 to 2020, he was Independent Chair of the Natural Capital Committee, providing advice to the government on the sustainable use of natural capital. And in the new year 2021 honours list, Dita was awarded a knighthood for services to the environment, energy and utilities policy. Um, we're so lucky in Oxfordshire to have such passionate and brilliant academic minds and practitioners in our midst. So um, I won't say any more, and I'm delighted to hand you over to Dita now to hear his thoughts on COP26, what next? Well, thanks very much, Camilla, and thank you very much for the very kind invitation today. I, I feel that, um, and it's uh, reflected in the background uh, screens that you guys are all doers and I can see the natural environment right in front of me uh, looking at your screens. As you can see, I'm surrounded by books and that's both a plus and a minus. But thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, speak today. And what I'd like to do is kick off by um, some sobering thoughts about what COP26 did or did not do, to set a context within which to look at essentially the role of land and land use, and linking to that, what can be done at the local level as opposed to the global level to address both climate change and of course the other uh, serious challenges that we have to the natural environment. So, uh, I will look at this uh, climate change through a natural capital lens, and I think that's the right way to do it, as they say. Uh, but first of all, let me provide some context. And I'll try to end up with linking this right back to the local uh, things, as I say, on the ground, and in particular, uh, the kinds of initiatives which are, in my world, both no regrets policies, things you should do anyway, uh, but better than that, uh, a win-win that they're both carbon, biodiversity and other uh, natural capital benefits orientated. So that's the, the path I want to weave through. So let's start at the beginning. And I always think it's worth getting the sobering and dare I say somewhat depressing things out the way at the start and then move from uh, the negative on to, okay, so what can we do about it? and the positives uh, that we can take away. So I think those who, who've uh, followed um, my commentaries in the past on climate change negotiations will not be surprised that I didn't anticipate that COP26 would achieve very much, uh, the previous 25 didn't, and I don't actually think that uh, all those world leaders walking away from COP26 you know, making great claims about what's been achieved are serving us very well in the face of the climate change challenge. And I think there are some fundamental underlying issues, uh, questions which make the COP process, well, useful, but not much more than jaw jaw. So let's first of all remind ourselves what climate change is. And in particular, what causes climate change? And you may think, oh, well, we know all that. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, it isn't in the following sense. Climate change is the consequence of increases in the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's about, to put it in shorthand, parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, where carbon includes the other greenhouse gases as a proxy. Okay. So you might think that at uh, COP26 and all the previous 25 COPs, that the targets were about reducing the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. They're not. They're about reducing emissions from particular measured sources. And they're about territorial emissions. They're not 
uh, and they're about the production of those emissions. They're not about uh, emissions generally, and they're not about uh, the consumption side rather than the production side. And this matters in two senses. First of all, the facts of the last now 26 COPs has been that every single year since 1990, when all this lot started as the baseline, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere has been going up at two parts per million every single year. And that's the increase in concentration of the carbon in the atmosphere. And that's what causes climate change. That's the greenhouse effect. So you might think, well, um, surely, for example, last year, with all the lockdowns, that the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere couldn't have gone up the same as the year before. Fact is, it did. Even with the lockdowns, which is the greatest experiment in radically cutting emissions suddenly, there is not a blip in the continuing path of increasing carbon in the atmosphere. And I'm going to come to the reason why that's true, but I think it uh, gives a focus on uh, the extent to which the national uh, determined contributions, that's the targets that each country took on board, do not really adequately address the problem. You can see it in the UK most starkly. So if you were to listen to our prime minister, we're not discussing parties or the uh, mysterious parties that don't happen, um, when discussing the great contribution of the UK to addressing climate change and the leadership at COP26, et cetera, you know, what we're told is, look how much we've reduced emissions in the UK. Well, we have. Uh, our territorial carbon production of emissions has gone down a lot. But then does that mean that our carbon footprint has gone down? No. Why? Well, we've gradually, we we're already doing it before 1990, but since 1990 onwards, been switching from a, an economy that makes stuff, and with the making of stuff has lots of emissions with them, to an economy which basically is service-based. So as I flippantly remark sometimes, if you really want to get carbon emissions down quickly, best thing to do is to close the rest of the oil refineries close the Ineos petrochemical plant uh, in Scotland, uh, finish off the steel industry, and hope that Brexit finishes off the car industry, or a few other things. And just import the stuff from China instead, and our emissions will have gone down a lot, so we'll be showing world leadership, but actually climate change will have gone up as a result, because those uh, imported products are produced at higher carbon content than um, uh, the stuff domestically. Uh, this can't be laboured enough at this point. It's down to carbon consumption. It's our carbon footprint that counts. And for those familiar with agriculture, you know, we can easily uh, close down our livestock industry in the UK because after all, you know, the livestock produce a lot of methane and hey, why not import it from Brazil instead uh, on that cleared rainforest? Uh, and of course our emissions will go down of methane, but you know, our carbon footprint will have uh, gone up quite a lot. So by focusing on the wrong number, you get the wrong results. And indeed you incentivize the wrong results. And it makes people think that climate change is a local phenomena as opposed to a global one. And by that, I mean, it doesn't matter where in the world a ton of carbon's emitted. Uh, it's completely location independent. And if we cause emissions in the Amazon, or in China or elsewhere, so be it. Then you have to recognize that on the emission side, it's China, India, Africa, where climate change is going to be determined, like it or not. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't make, make, take measures to reduce emissions, of course. We're responsible for a lot of the stock that's been put up there over the last 200 years. Um, and um, uh, there's a great deal we can do uh, to contribute to that. But it does mean that the fiction that people have been given that if we were to mitigate climate change in the UK, that we therefore we'd avoid the costs of climate change. No, we're going to get both because actually climate change won't be determined here. Whatever contribution we should and will make here to addressing those problems 
it's going to be determined elsewhere. I have to say there ain't much prospect of holding to two degrees. There is no chance of holding to 1.5 and two parts per million is being added on a regular basis. Now, that point about carbon consumption matters a lot and was almost have in mind because it tells you we're going to have a lot of climate change, whether we like it or not. But the second thing that's missed out at COP26 is the bit that's really comes home to Oxfordshire and to localities. You know, climate change is not just about emissions. It's about the balance of emissions and sequestration. So for as long as life's existed on this planet, the natural environment soaks up carbon and the natural environment also emits carbon and we emit a lot of carbon too. So the sequestration side of the equation, what I would say the other half, is in my mind at least as important as the emission side. And on sequestration, do bear in mind that whereas our land should be absorbing carbon and taking it into our soils and so on, actually our land is a significant net emitter of carbon. So we're familiar with everyone focusing on building wind farms and solar panels and uh, other decentralized, disaggregated, low density energy sources. And there's a part for that to play. But we sometimes forget the soil has roughly four times the carbon of the atmosphere. And what modern agriculture has been doing is transferring that huge reservoir of carbon in the soils into the atmosphere. And that is a major contribution to the total emissions that take place. As an example, any of you who have been to the Fenlands will notice uh, on a windy day, particularly in summer, peat blowing across the road in front of you and we'll see how much the land has shrunk as the peat has been lost. That's like a row of, co row, uh, a row of coal power stations. On any sensible price of carbon, a lot of agriculture in the fens would, for example, stop. And that tells you how radical um, uh, the land use change might end up being if we were to address climate change on the sequestration side. And the sequestration side brings the local into the play. It matters in localities how carbon sequestrated. And it also brings in all the other environmental problems and gets us out of being in a pure carbon silo. And as a side, there is a really big danger that our land is converted into uh, trees, etc., tree coverage to capture carbon as quickly as possible with great incidental damage to natural capital. Trees are in principle good things if they're the right trees in the right place. But the wrong trees in the wrong place, look at some of the industrial scale forestry uh, of the 20th century, can be pretty bad for the other natural capitals. And a shortcut to this is also to recognize that not only do the soils have roughly four times the carbon of the atmosphere, carbon in the soils is quite a good measure of biodiversity. It's not perfect, but it's a quite useful proxy. And bear in mind that most biodiversity is underneath your feet, not above. We can get terribly excited about beavers and uh, bison and um, uh, lynxes and wolves and so on. But in terms of the ecological systems, what overwhelmingly matters is what's in that soil. So this is what brings me to the contribution of land use to the climate change uh, issues. And land use is relevant to adaptation. We're going to have a lot of climate change. Cops aren't doing the job. And um, there is a huge amount of emissions to come in India, China, and Africa going forward. Just as an aside, you know, we think about Africa where the growth rates are very substantial. You know, the application of fertilizers uh, and chemicals is very low at the moment, likely to increase a great deal. And the population growth is substantial. You know, Nigeria is probably going to double in population by the middle of this century, by our great 250 targets. 
Uh, and by that time, Nigeria may have more people than the whole EU or more people than the whole of the United States of America. These are radical transitions where uh, the big impacts will come. But um, land use change impacts on the uh, adaptation side, and it, of course, applies on the emission side. So look at Oxfordshire. Um, I don't do this anymore, but I'm sure some of you fly over the top of Oxfordshire um, and look down at it. Look at the uh, arable lands of Oxfordshire. Look at the uh, where the soils are, are, are well uh, matched to arable production. Uh, take a look at what's going on around you. Now, we know for the UK as a whole that about 70% of all land is under some form of agriculture. I don't know the no number for Oxfordshire, but I bet it's pretty large. And uh, if we look at what's going on on that land, uh, we can say two things. First of all, the economic value of what agriculture is producing is pretty low. And the other side of it is that relative to its economic size, agriculture is by far the largest emitter of carbon in the UK economy. By the way, globally, it's about 25% of total emissions. Um, people don't talk about agriculture immediately when they talk about climate change, they talk about wind farms and solar panels, but we should go straight from climate change to agriculture because that's both where the emissions are very high and where actually um, there is uh, sadly scope that those emissions might rise even further. So what do the emissions look like? Well, the measured emissions from UK agriculture are about 10% of UK emissions. 11%, something like that, okay? But that number doesn't really include the loss from the soils and the loss from the peaks. Rough rule of thumb kind of estimate, ballpark estimate, maybe it's more like 15. Okay. Well, the whole power sector is only 19, right? But the difference is that the contribution to the economy of agriculture is 0.5% of GDP. And most of that 0.5% of GDP is actually subsidies. So the total value of the produce of agriculture in the UK is pretty, dare I say, insignificant in GDP terms. Lots of problems about GDP terms, but in GDP terms, it's pretty insignificant. Okay. So put the other way around, a very small part of the total economy produces a hugely disproportionate part of the total emissions, whereas the land should be sequestrating, not emitting. So put it one other way too, the scope for improvement is enormous because the value of the output that might be displaced is very small if we go in the right direction. And of course, that's assuming that you think that current agricultural practice is sustainable. And, and I know, you know people have visions of agriculture and the food they're eating, and they think if they eat tomatoes, they'll be using producing lower carbon footprint than if they eat uh, poultry or whatever. But the reality of modern agriculture is that it is overwhelmingly carbon dependent. When you uh, buy some uh, tomatoes from the supermarket wrapped in plastic, and you look back to the chemical inputs and the other uh, heating and other uh, contributions that go into the producing those tomatoes, you're really drinking diesel or oil or eating diesel and oil and in very large measures. In fact, tomatoes turn out to be one of the most highly carbon intensive foodstuffs that we eat. That's just to, as an aside for those who think that being vegetarian solves the problem. It's more complicated than that. But broadly, the way the human civilization got from 2 billion people in 1990 to 7 billion or so now was because oil, gas, and coal were applied to agriculture. And overwhelmingly, it's about fertilizer and uh, getting the nitrogen to the crops. And also it's about the replacement of manpower, uh, or actually women power, a lot of it, um, 
and um, horses with tractors and farm machinery. And then the huge supply chain, which comes once the food is cropped, feeding right through to your table and your breakfast. And um, there are you know, apps and so on one can look at, but um, one of the things I recommend in my Net Zero book is that everyone constructs a carbon diary where you write down for your typical day, the stuff you do, the stuff you consume, um, actually the clothes and stuff you're wearing, all that kind of thing too, and try and have a hazard a guess at how much carbon is involved in uh, your daily activities. And one of the surprises you'll find is the food is really carbon intensive. Of course, if you use stuff with palm oil in it, it might be even worse than if you use uh, some of the more conventionals. But even the so-called um, low carbon uh, food sources uh, coming down away from meat towards cereals and so on have a lot of carbon in it. The way to think about your food is that basically you want to think about how many tablespoons of diesel or oil you're actually consuming when you consume your food. And this matters because when you look at the landscape, it's easy to think, well, we could do regenerative agriculture, uh, we could all be organic, et cetera. Um, and I have huge support for, for um, uh, some of those farm practices, pastures for life and so on, doing excellent things. But if you think we're gonna feed 7 billion people on that basis and using manure um, uh, uh, and composting as the basis for providing the nitrogen to provide the crop yields that will be needed in order to feed those people, let alone increase their uh, dietary in intake, particularly in the developing world, the numbers at the moment just don't add up. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Doesn't mean that the, those steps shouldn't be taken. Doesn't mean that one shouldn't go local rather than global. And then one shouldn't think very, very hard about food waste, et cetera. All those things need to be done. But a simple switch from uh, the world we're in, in land use and the way it works, to a bucolic one that I suspect most of the people uh, listening and certainly myself would ideally and romantically like to live in, that's quite a hard call. So um, we have to be realistic, but we also have to recognize that it's that land use that's creating the emissions that confront us and ought to be dealt with. Now, the approach that people take to this problem is to say, ah, yes, well, what we could do is we could farm the land for carbon. So we could engage in carbon farming. And what we could do is take land from its current uh, uses and plant trees all over it. Um, and what's more, um, there are companies and organizations out there, all of whom are merrily declaring their own net zero targets, often with no real understanding of what their contribution in terms of carbon emissions are. And having declared a target, realizing that, oh dear, we're just not gonna make it because we've got some emissions associated with our activities, which were just uh, so-called hard to abate. So instead, let's go out there and buy up land or pay landowners to plant trees to offset the carbon emissions we're making. Now, in theory, what could be wrong with that? Reducing a ton of carbon emissions or increasing a ton of carbon sequestration, they're just the two sides of the same coin. But the realities are somewhat different from this neat theory. And that's not to say that carbon offsetting isn't useful, and by the way, it will be a significant source of revenue to those who want to pursue more nature-based approaches to land use um, and are involved in trying to improve the state of our countryside. They are uh, the step up from the um, landfill levy revenues on steroids for the revenue that they might yield in the future. And indeed, if you look at some of the uplands, 
not Oxfordshire, but if you look away from Oxfordshire, you look at what's going on in Scotland, there is a big land grab going on. Financial institutions are buying up big blocks of estates and then uh, proposing to sell the carbon offsets of those to all those industrial companies with hard to abate emissions, with lots of consequences for local communities. I sometimes describe what's happening in Scotland as another version of the clearances. Uh, the uh, aristocracy cleared the people for, the, for sheep. We're now clearing the sheep and the deer, hopefully the deer, um, uh, for carbon. And many of the local communities and the community engagements that go with the management of land around some of these estates are um, being put outside the metaphorical uh, barbed wire fence around it. Although in the top of Scotland, there is a plan to put wolves in uh, back. And of course, uh, you'll need a fence around uh, quite a large amount of land to keep them in, but then you can run a safari park instead, probably uh, to pay for those costs. I say that slightly cynically, but you have to be aware of just how big a transition of land ownership and land use some financial institutions have in mind. Now, planting trees, sequestrating carbon, putting the carbon back in the soil is a good thing to do. And nothing I want, uh, I've said should suggest anything other than that, but it should be done in the context of all the natural capitals, not simply as a carbon silo. And the way to do this, work this out, is not difficult. The first thing you need is a baseline. You have to know what you've got before you work out what the impact of changing it is. Unfortunately, I have a lot of satellite data and other data, which helps us get a long way further forward to understanding our local natural capital in a way that five years ago would have been inconceivable. I compare it with the ability to invent a vaccine in 10 days from a new virus, which we can do now through the genetic sequencing, compared with five, 10 years ago, where you just muck around with the latest flu version and see if it works. And for those of those with a long memory, uh, you won't find much mention of Asian flu in the late 60s in the records, but there was no genetic capacity to react to that. Well, similarly, I think the digitalization of our knowledge of what's in the land gets us to our baselines much better, not perfectly. Secondly, you need a counterfactual. You need to know what would have happened to the land if you had not made the intervention that's being proposed to make to improve carbon sequestration, for example. And that's not obvious. It's not necessarily continuity of what we've got. You need to know if you're going to make an enhancement by planting trees, for example, um, uh, you need to know what the costs of capital maintenance are. Trees burn down, they blow down, they get eaten by deer and squirrels and lots of other things. It's not trivial to maintain trees to take them through to their maximum carbon yielding uh, uh, outcomes. You need to know what's going to happen at the end of life. Um, you know, it's world of difference between taking a tree at the end of life and turning it into a timber frame building or letting the lie on the ground and the, and the uh, natural environment take back the carbon into the soils, as opposed to chopping up the wood pellets and burning it in, say, Drax power station. That's a completely different outcome and it puts the carbon back in the atmosphere. So it's complicated and every site is different because the other natural capitals are all different site by site. Trees, for example, of a particular kind might do a great deal to improve the even load, the Thames catchment, et cetera, by uh, uh, partly uh, just acting as own, their own natural flood defenses, but also stopping the runoff of chemicals into uh, rivers, et cetera. So there are all kinds of dimensions to this. And that brings me sort of, sort of full circle back to, well, what does this mean in terms of what happens locally. So COP26, all you should read from that is, it's probably not gonna work. The NDCs don't measure carbon concentration in the atmosphere. They don't look at carbon consumption, they look at carbon production. Sequestration is not taken very seriously. 
And then the other two bits, by the way, of COP26, the climate fund to help developing countries uh, decarbonize and the forestry fund. Um, I mean, if these weren't really serious problems, the idea that the developed world will provide 100 billion or try to provide 100 billion per annum is laughable in comparison with the scale of the problems. We basically provide about 75 billion and we've been trying to do that for quite some time. Let me tell you that 75 billion is equal to the annual dividend, the annual dividend of Saudi Aramco. That puts it in perspective. And on the forestry side, it's 7 billion public, 7 billion private. And I think we've been trying to do that since 2008. And when you tell people you're going to try to stop uh, deforestation in 2030, actually, it could even be a perverse incentive to burn down the Amazon even quicker than the current Brazilian government is doing, which is at a record fast pace. So I don't think we should look to the COP framework to solve our problems. It has advantages, it raises the profile, it gets people talking about this stuff, it makes political leaders engage, but it ain't gonna solve climate change, it ain't gonna hold us to 1.5. Um, and indeed, uh, my personal view is two, two degrees will be extremely hard to achieve within 29 years from now. This is all there is between now and um, uh, 2050. So that's the background. What we should read locally about that is, of course, we should go on focusing on our own carbon consumption. And of course, uh, we should um, do what we can to contribute to this um, huge scale, uh, almost existential crisis. We should do those things. But in the process of doing that, we must recognize that we're going to get climate change and we must think about adaptation and we must think about the way we use the land and the way we use the land at the moment is uniquely inefficient. It's pretty hard to think how we could get less for the amount of money we're spending on agriculture and how agriculture could be worse in terms of the emissions that it's currently making. My conclusion from that is the scope for improvement is enormous. The opportunities to do stuff about this is great. And because agriculture and land use is always local, it has to be at a local level. So when one thinks about what one can do locally, it's about planting hedges. It's about planting the right trees in the right place. It's about uh, reducing direct agriculture into the rivers and the runoff. Where I am in, uh, in the very west of Oxfordshire now, uh, by the even load, the fields are virtually ploughed up and I've been watching the fertiliser go on almost to the river bank. How could that be a sensible way of using land use? That's a local change with local improvements that are required to take things forward. And the other thing to bear in mind, the biodiversity, of course, is crucial in the land use change, and land use change is essential to addressing biodiversity. But you have to also remember that if what we're trying to do in protecting and enhancing natural capital as part of addressing climate change, we have to remember that natural capital is for us. Nature doesn't care at all if the last... Um, uh, peregrine that takes out a swallow or um, uh, a sparrowhawk, even actually a merlin takes one out, and that's the last swallow. Nature won't care. We will. We'll have lost something uh, critical. And what that means is that natural capital has its greatest value when it's next to people, right next to urban populations, right next to where people can get the mental and physical health benefits can get the benefits of improved water quality, can get the enjoyment of biodiversity, and yes, be make the natural capital part of the community. That's absolutely crucial and was crucial to all the work that we did in the Natural Capital Committee. So I think an integrated approach focused around natural capital, looking for the no regrets things which are worth doing anyway, doing carbon farming in the broader sense in uh, uh, aligned with natural capital improvement generally, 
is the way that any local community can make the greatest contribution to doing their admittedly very tiny bit to addressing the climate change we confront. And in doing that, right down to us as individuals, try that carbon diary and ask yourself how much your life would have to change if in 2050, you rewrote that carbon diary without the carbon, without the palm oil, without the fossil fuels, without all the energy intensive activities, without the damage being done to the soils and so on. And that shows you the challenge. So I think joining up the local with the global has to be the sequestration route, has to be the land use route, and has to have natural capital as a lens. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Sadita Helton. That's a, a, a wonderful um, uh, talk. I, I found it both scary and uh, hopeful in equal measure. And um, um, certainly one of my takeaways is the, um, the way that the UK is exporting our um, carbon emissions. That's a really, really important point. Um, so we, we've got some questions starting to come into the, um, into the um, chat. I, um, I um, encourage all of our um, um, uh, uh, audience to um, to add some questions there. I'm, I'm going to start with, with, with a couple of questions which I think are linked and are about um, sort of land use in the UK. So um, uh, Carol Neal asks, is 30 by 30, so 30% 30 of the land protected by 2030 enough? We haven't done so well with rainforests. So what how, chance have we got to restore peat bogs, kelp forest, seagrass, etc.? And then also Richard Harding asks, we have huge pressures on our land for food development, solar farms, biomass, biodiversity. How can communities, local and national, balance these pressures? So I think that both of these questions then are about, you know, effectively a land use strategy for the United Kingdom. And then perhaps we'd be interested in your view about how that could relate to, um, into Oxfordshire as well. So um, do we need a land use strategy and a land use policy? Yes, of course we do. And that's exactly what we don't have. I mean, we have got big opportunities. The Agricultural Act, the Amendment to the Climate Change Act, and the Environment Act are the biggest burst of essentially environmental uh, legislation that we've seen for a huge long time. Okay, And each one is pregnant with enormous opportunities. And remember, the, the Environment Act, which embeds the 25-year plan, which was the greatest thing that we did in the... Um, uh, Natural Capital Committee, the Environment Act is going to uh, carry through the setting of statutory targets this autumn, uh, including uh, water, but air, waste and biodiversity. So the big scope in here and the public goods, public money and the um, stuff is part of that frame. Um, so there's big opportunities. We don't have a land use policy. We need one. The 25 year plan is a sort of proxy for a bit of a land use uh, uh, strategy, but we need more. And we need land use um, plans and strategies, not just for the country as a whole, we actually need a global one, uh, including preserving rainforests. We need one local. Everyone needs a local view about the use of the land. We cannot leave it, with all due respect, to the owners of land to decide what happens to this vital community asset, which we have a lease on, not a freehold for future generations. Now, that leads to people saying, oh, well, OK, here's some simple rules, you know, 30-30. Right? Sounds good. And I'm not against um, things that catch people's imagination. But you know what really worries me about a lot of land conservation? We say, we'll look after this bit of land. We've lost the other bit. We'll look after what happens around the outside of the field. We'll look at the hedgerows and the field margins. But what actually happens in the crop, that's too bad. That's not the way we want to do it. What we want to do is think about how we're going to use, have a plan for 100% of land, not 30%. And we have to think about how that land is going to produce food, quite a lot of that land, and at the same time, produce um, the kinds of natural capital outcomes we want. And my fear is that we're going to have a quick radical switch from intensive car to intensive carbon farming from intensive uh, agriculture in its current form. And that isn't gonna help. You know, that isn't gonna get back the 80% of the insects we've lost. 
right? We have to worry what happens inside the fields outside. So that's important. In terms of the plans, you know, there are a huge number of things to do. I'm doing a lot of work on the Brighton, uh, Greater Brighton area, kelp forest. Fantastic opportunity. And, you know, if we just get the fishing boats out, that would be even better. You know, fishing is 0.02% of GDP, employs 12,000 people, and in its current practices, it essentially plows the sea bottom. Our marine protected areas aren't properly protected, not an Oxfordshire problem, but it's a big problem generally, huge opportunities. So we should do stuff like that. We should do stuff to protect the peat, you know, grazing sheep on peat. I mean, where's the economic value of the sheep? Right, compared with things. So you know, what this tells you is, although I think it's right to be scared by what's happening, by the big picture, I absolutely don't want to shy away at all from this is potentially really globally awful. But what it tells you is in a massive cornucopia of stuff to do here, which has multiple win-win benefits. And, you know, local groups, everywhere I go, local groups, they've got thousands of projects and ideas. You know, yeah, great. It's like the background to your slide. Let the thousand flowers bloom. We can do that stuff. Well, thank you so much. Um, um, so, and my background, by the way, is the um, Thames uh, meadow and um, floodplains near where I live in Ensham. So, um, um, on a similar um, sort of theme, then, and to pick up your point about that, we need to be um, concerned about what's happening in the field as well as the field margins. Um, Maria Spink asks. Um, that she's so glad that you've mentioned soil carbon and the natural carbon cycle and the focus seems to be diverted away from fossil fuel as the primary cause of new co2 and methane why can't we tax fossil fuel products such as all synthetic chemicals used in agriculture and instead prioritize regenerative organic farming with no-till okay so there are two parts to that question maria and uh, thank you very much for your question and i trust all's well with you um the first part is should we tax carbon right Okay, I, I, the second part is, should we tax some of the synthetic fertilizers, et cetera? And the third one is, should we promote regenerative agriculture? And they're not actually all the same question, right? So the first one is, I am in favor of putting a price on carbon, all carbon everywhere. Okay, so imports, so that imported beef, the carbon content of which comes from Brazil, should face the same carbon price and methane constraints that beef producers in Britain are producing. It's nonsense to have uh, a carbon price in Europe and the UK and elsewhere and not a global one. It just actually promotes climate change because it promotes the outsourcing of emissions elsewhere. And I think the carbon price should apply to agriculture, heating, transport and electricity and, uh, 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 and fuel for cars and so on, everything. So that then, dare I say, we can let the market, let us individuals sort out, face with the true costs of what we're doing, the things we're gonna buy. There'll be ultras out there who'll do the right thing, but most of us aren't ultras and actually just confronting polluters, that's you and me, it's not those companies, they do the stuff for us. They make the fertilizer to grow the crops, for us to buy cheap food in the shop, right? Everything in the economy ultimately is for people. There's nothing else. And we are the polluters and polluters should pay. So I'm in favor of that. The question about what you should tax, I like to go to primary source carbon so that the fertilizer manufacturer has to pay a lot more for the oil and gas that they use to produce the fertilizer. And if they use hydrogen instead, they'll pay a lot less, right? So it's, you don't have to make it at the, you know, what's the carbon tax of a loaf of bread versus the carbon tax of a, of a, of a Mars bar versus the carbon tax of um, uh, uh, some porridge, okay? It goes into the input costs and often, often firms formally pay that, but it comes through to us in our final prices. So the regenerative agriculture, the things here that should be supported are first of all, if, the other stuff is paying a price of carbon. It's an obvious benefit to the stuff, to the activities that aren't using carbon inputs, okay? But regenerative agriculture is producing lots of other things which ought to be paid for that aren't. So biodiversity, right? It produces that. It produces better water. It produces mental and physical health benefits. And one of the great problems is that we can think about ways people are gonna get a reward for the carbon bit, 
but we're not paying the price properly for the benefits that come from the way they use land, which for the health service, for just mental health benefits, for the kids, for the biodiversity, et cetera. And that, if we aren't prepared to pay people to do that stuff, then we have to use ELMS type schemes and other subsidies to support those activities. Great, thank you so much. Um, um, on, on, a, on a similar sort of um, theme then, um, um, and bringing it sort of um, specifically in, into um, Oxfordshire, um, um, and um, uh, and the role of the um, um, the um, the university, Oxford University, as a landowner. Chris Cousins asked, um, "What extent do you think the Oxford universities and colleges, particularly as landowners and developers, as opposed to their academic role, are showing leadership on climate change? And what would you like them to see um, do more of?" Okay, so um, you have to remember when you look at Oxford University that uh, it isn't one entity. It's lots of entities. You know, I'm sitting in New College here. We're a separate entity like all the other colleges are. We're in a confederation. And so there are lots and lots of separate decision makers going in this space, not one unique frame. The second thing to say is that um, I'm a great believer that uh, if you're going to uh, preach to the world what they should do, you should start at home. Okay. So in my college, I've been um uh i almost find it sort of um uh as a joke almost i take it seriously but most people think i'm just being amusing when i say why haven't we got a wildflower meadow out here below my rooms in the main quad why are we using slug pellets and chemicals in the gardens okay really practical little things that we don't do right why aren't we turning down the heat why aren't we, dare I say, it would cause a riot, but um, dare I say, it, why don't we suggest that everyone wears a few more pullovers, right? And turns the temperature of the of buildings down to what they were 15 years ago, okay? Now, these don't make much difference to climate change, right? But the point is, they do make a difference to quite a lot of other things. So the biodiversity would go up. They do make some contribution to climate change and it gives consistency and leadership. OK, it's like the issue of, you know, Boris Johnson flies back in a plane from Glasgow cop to get back to a dinner with the Daily Telegraph. Right. And even the leader of Brighton Council, who's the green chair of the council, flies to Glasgow. Right. It's about symbols as well as practicality. Now, in terms of practicalities, uh, measuring the carbon footprint of the university will be a first really big step. And I mean, seriously measuring it. And then in the land holdings, most colleges and the university is now committed to so-called ESG. I would love it if they actually made ESG mean what it's supposed to mean, as opposed to quite a lot of greenwash and quite a lot of engagement. So a lot more to do, um, but um, I suspect compared with quite a lot of actors in Oxfordshire, the university is a naturally benign institution whose intentions are in the right place. Thank you, and more power to your elbow then in those conversations in your college. Um, well, one um, day, one day there'll be a plaque um, uh, put up as they do to all fellows eventually when they decease saying, he promoted the wildflower lawn in the <laughs> quad in New College. Excellent. Well, Let's hope that happens. So um, uh, just an, a note um, for colleagues who are on the call, we've got some interesting um, sort of links and so on in the chat. There's a, effectively a sort of a secondary conversation happening there as well. We only have a couple more minutes. I know you have to leave at 11, um, Sudita. So um, um, but here's a question from Debbie Dance um, 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 from the Oxford Preservation Trust to everyone. Um, and uh, you picked up on, on this theme in your um, talk around planting the right trees in the right place. And so Debbie asks, how can we work together locally to deal with the PR around planting trees in the right and not the wrong places when the message to the public is that trees are good regardless and where the role of flood meadows say in carbon sequestration is less well known. So I think you talked about soil carbon. So um, yes, the dominance of trees as the, as the, as the, as the vehicle of uh, natural capital. So, so I think that there's several things to say. First of all, it's easy to castigate uh, farmers for particular actions they take, but they're just businesses. They seek profits, okay? And if you incentivize them to do things in different ways, they'll do things in different ways. The real worry at the moment is that the game, and you can look up the web, loads of people will sign up for any farmer who wants to do this, 
The game is how many carbon credits can you sell? Right? And the problem is, if that's what you measure, that's what you get paid for, that's what they're going to do. Okay? And, and, and you know, there'll be benign farmers, there are probably wonderful landowners on this, on this, uh, 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 on this Zoom, but uh, most are just commercial because they have to be, they're living, et cetera. So you have to engage with the world as it is. Right? But, the, but the point remains that this is where education via communities really counts. So I've just moved to the very west of Oxfordshire, um, right by the Eden Lode. I can watch the chemicals going straight into the river, right, at one level, but I can just walk across into Gloucestershire and I see my local uh, flood action group, uh, a local community, thinking really hard about the stuff they can do in the local assets that are available, and the parish council, et cetera. And, you know, we kind of lost sight of what really local government and local communities do in, 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 in just in the border into Gloucestershire. It's a fabulous community shop, absolutely thriving. And there are people volunteering, doing stuff. And if you add up all of these contributions and you work out how to bring to these groups the carbon dimension in a natural capital way for the benefit of the local school, for the benefit of the, the local park, et cetera, and in the even low case for the uh, benefit of the sorry state that the river has become. Um, this is empowering and that's how to do it. And then it's, you know, you can see the books behind me. It's about education. It's about the facts. It's about not pretending that climate change is gonna go away and easily be solved. Tell people the truth and tell them what they can do and help them to do it. And the little partnerships, you know, how do you get a community which says, you know, we'd quite like some hedges around the playing field, right? Where do the hedgelings come from? Most people haven't got a clue. They don't even know. They would like native species. They don't know what these are. You know, that's where voluntary groups, dare I say, like your own, have a really powerful role to play. And um, I think in the coronavirus, we discovered, discovered, discovered a bit more about what communities are. But that's what you have to do, because only people will solve the problem, because only people will benefit from what we're trying to do. Thank you so much. Um, and um, really interesting that you've picked up on that, that local theme. Um, so um, um, with, with that that final question, then I'll, I'll wrap up um, our, our talk today and thank um, um, Professor Sadita Helm so much for, um, for our annual lecture. You've given us a um, huge amount of food for thought. I think particularly I, taking away um, that we need to think about um, um, the climate change in terms of um, our carbon consumption and parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, but also you've helped us to link um, what we do locally to that, that global picture. And as, as World Oxfordshire, I hope we can make our small contribution to bring communities and, and partnerships together um, to help to um, allow natural capital and biodiversity to flourish as well as um, um, perhaps capture a few molecules of um, carbon dioxide in some of that soil organic matter. So, so thank you very much. Thank you to Camilla for um,